loud this afternoon all of us we have lovely voice here in this room amen one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying are you not the Christ save yourself and us but the other rebuked him saying do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So uh, the sheets that you have, maybe you just follow some of the questions, glance at it, and then when you see that we are touching some of the text, you will be able to uh, fill, fill these, uh, or uh, help at least help you remember the, the, the main points of this story. So we have the story here of two partners in crime. Two bad, bad guys. Do you agree they are bad guys? So we see, usually we, we call them the thief, uh, the good thief, the bad thief, or the repentant thief or something. But I think they are much more than thief, because this is just a word, thief. Because here they are, what, sentenced to what? Sentenced to death. So it tells me that they probably have done something really horrible, that they are sentenced to death. They are thief, maybe they are in prison. Or maybe they get their head, uh, the, not their head, but their, their hand chopped off. I don't know. But to have this kind of uh, sentence given to them, I think they are very horrible people. And uh, so anyway, I think they were both punished for the same crime. That's my opinion, because they seem to talk to each other, to know each other. They've been crucified at the same time for the same kind of crime. So I, I assume I, the Bible does not tell us. Uh, we read in verse 41, for we are, we are receiving the due retribution of our uh, deeds. So we, that, that, that's, that's like this. So this story, why I chose this story to come into evangelism with that? Because it is one of the most familiar story of the Bible. A lot of people know about this story. Even unsafe people will quote this for different reasons. It's a well-known story of the repentant criminal or the good thief, as you some would call him. In reality, this text has brought also a lot of comfort to many, many troubled-minded people. This is, as I said in the opening, one of Jesus' greatest trophy, what he has succeeded to do in his dying moments on the cross. It's a very touching movie, uh, story. Lesson number one on that is we can see Christ's power in this because he saved that man and Christ's willingness to address an horrible person. And I think we can learn something uh, of that. And that's why I, we will see with Paul, we are not ashamed of the gospel, the message of the gospel, because as it says in Romans chapter 1, it is the power of God for those who believe, the power unto salvation for those who believe. So the message of the gospel that we see in that story, in the old message of the gospel, there's power. The power of Christ is, is, is revealed in these kind of stories. When you preach the, the word of grace, the, the love of Jesus, like our theme for these evangelism weeks will be spreading God's word. When, when you spread God's word, you're spreading the power of Christ to save. You are declaring the power of Christ to save. You're talking about his love, about his willingness, about his caring for the soul of the lost. So that's a reminder for us. That's a great story for all of us. The main doctrine of that story is that Jesus is mighty to save. If you look at this situation, okay, imagine you have three people crucified on the cross. Can you picture that with me this afternoon? Three pictures, three people crucified, hanging on the, on the tree. How long, I'm asking you a question, how long will it be before they will die? Two weeks? No. Maybe two hours, maybe one hour. So they are very near death. Is that, do you agree with that? Yes. They are very near, very near death. So it's a very desperate. Is there a more hopeless and desperate situation than the situation you read about in that story? 
Is there something as bad as this, as critical, as dramatic as this story? Is there? Do you think of more dramatic story than that story? Is that dramatic enough? Yes, it is dramatic enough. I think I would say it's dramatic enough. So it's a very, very si disparate situation that these criminals were in. Can they easily get out of that situation? No. no. What is most likely the end of these people on the cross? Die? Yes, yes. Okay, so we are agree on that, yeah. Look at these criminals. What kind of man were they? Yeah, sinners, but can we be more practical than sinners? Can we, can we let our imagination work a little bit? I'm sorry? Notorious. Thieves. More than thieves. Killers, maybe, or I don't know. Murderers. Maybe they are against the government. I don't know what they do because we don't really know. But we know that according to the, the chastisement, the punishment they receive, the verdict they have received, this is the, the worst of the worst in society. Okay, we agree on that? Yes, okay, good, good. They have been sentenced to be crucified. They have done something horrible. They live doing evil. And they are doing because of the evil they have done. So that's what they are receiving. But see what happened. One of them was mocking and cursing and then suddenly turned to Jesus and in fact expressed a prayer. He just changed. He, they are cursing and then, but the other rebuking him saying, don't you fear God? We have under the same sentence. We indeed justly, we receive it. It's justice for us, but not for this man. It's not justice. For us, we are receiving due retribution. So it's, it's okay. So what happened to this man? So what is he really asking for? What is he really saying, this man? What lesson can we learn? Look at this criminal. Look at this criminal. He expressed a prayer, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom. That's not a long prayer. Not a lot of theology in that prayer. You know, some people say, if you don't say in the name of Jesus after you finish praying, it, God cannot answer your prayer because you didn't just say, finish your prayer with, you know. Some, many people in China, they believe that when we were in there. You must say, uh, you know, that. Okay, so see what happened over here. So what is he really asking for? What is this man asking really in Jesus? Help me by saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Forgiveness, Forgiveness salvation, yeah. Yes. 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 Where does he want to go? He says, remember me when you come into your... So what does that indicate? The coming of the kingdom of heaven. He believed that Jesus has a kingdom. In other words, that he would be a messiah, the messiah or the king or something. So this, this sudden change of him on the cross, what does that indicate? is changed. What does that indicate? Repentance. repentance. That he has a repentant heart. That's why we call that story the story of the repentant criminal or the repentant uh, thief. Okay, now there's another person on the cross with them. What kind of answer has he received? What kind of answer has he received? And difference? Shut up. I'm suffering myself, leave me alone, too late, you're too bad. What, what is the answer that he received? Okay, so, so in other words, what kind of uh, answer? Acceptance? W were they rude words? 
judgmental? No. no. Okay, so we're going somewhere. So some of us or in the world would look at such a person and say, kill him. Just like, look what he has done. He's, he's not worth anything. It's too late. This kind of people has crossed the line. Cannot bring them back. There's a lot of people who think something similar like that. But the Lord spoke kindly to this man. And, and it's good for us to remember because, you know, I would be uh, tempted to be in the group says, wow, this is a really bad guy. I don't know if there's hope for someone like this. Honestly speaking, I can think like this. Do you know horrible people? Like really, really horrible people that you are, you know, ashamed of. But the Lord spoke kindly to this man. And not only that, he reassured him. He gave him an assurance. You will be in paradise with me today. Okay. So this is clear that through this statement of Jesus Christ, this man was justified, isn't it? Would you say that? That is a declaration of justification? Do you understand my question? Because only a few people answer my questions. So that means the others have not understood my questions. They are writing. They are writing. Oh, Bridget is so kind. She is so <laughs> kind. I, 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 love, I love her because she always makes me think that relax, relax. Be soft, be soft, you know. <laughs> Understand other people. Yeah. She's a great example to me. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so to me, this, this answer of Jesus is a clear indication of justification. If Jesus does not make him right, declare him right, he's not going to tell him, today you will be in paradise with me. He says, sorry, eh? cannot take you there. Can, can sinner go to heaven? Ah. Yes, if they are safe. If they are justified, no, if they are not justified. So, they have to be justified. Can you repeat that question because it seems there's some confusion here. Well, we have no and we have yes. yes. No, but the both answers are true. True, yes, that's what I'm saying. Can you clarify that? Is this an indicate, indication that this man is justified? Some said no, some said yes. He is justified. But my question was, can someone sinner go to heaven? That's why we have the yes and the no. Can someone sinner or ju not justified go to heaven? No. Because some says, yes, if they are justified, they can go to heaven. No, if they are not justified, they cannot go to heaven. Which is the same thing. Okay. All right. So the verdict of his condemnation has been lifted by the Lord Jesus. And he is going straight to glory. Wow, this is an amazing story. Think about this. This is very good evangelism. Jesus is the best evangelist. Amen? Amen. For sure. Okay, another truth. This is really awesome when I uh, realize that. Of all the people saved that you read about in the Bible, or that you can think of among your friends and Christian friends, of all the people saved that you have heard about or read about, no one else than this horrible man has received such a glorious assurance of salvation. No one else has ever received such a declaration of salvation. You, 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 have you read about something like this to any other text in the Bible? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. Have you ever read something like that anywhere else in the whole world? Me neither. So that's why I'm saying of all the people saved, there is not another person that has received such an assured uh, declaration of salvation as this man. Wow. I want to hear you say, wow. wow. Yes. Today you will be in, me in paradise. Wow. wow. One more wow. Wow. Wow, yes, yes. It, it deserves a wow, something like that. It sure does deserve it. Okay, one more question since you are so clever and you participate so well. Paradise. Why has. <laughs> ah, you want to repeat after me? Paradise. Yes, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
All right, thank you, Zeni. I like, I love you, Zeni, and uh, you're, you're my encourager this afternoon, yes. Paradise. Why, what is paradise? Where does that word come from? What is paradise? Why does Jesus use paradise? Yes, yes, yes. You know paradise in the old, old time, in the old culture of uh, Eastern, Mid-Eastern. You heard that from Persian king. The Persian king had great park with animals and flowers. They're very exotic. They were paradise. They were called paradise. In Jewish theology, the word paradise were equivalent to you know the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man? When Lazarus went in the place of the dead, Abraham's bosom, a place where the righteous would wait until the resurrection. That's also the idea in Jewish uh, theology. Paradise is the place of the dead, where the dead go until the resurrection. So. Where else do we read about paradise in the New Testament? The word paradisos is used three times only in the New Testament. The f one time here. The second time is where? New Testament. Thank you. But yes, it's true. Who has been captured to the? Paul to paradise. He was cut up to paradise. Second Corinthians twelve four. He was cut up to paradise, where he heard things so magnificent to be expressed in words. Such such a great exaltation. He went to the seven heavens and to paradise, and he heard you know mysteries so great that he could not even express it in words. So that's one of the place. Another place is in Revelation chapter two verse seven. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. That's the paradise. The idea why the word paradise is used there, it will be so magnificent in the new Jerusalem with God. It will be so magnificent when we will go into eternity with God that it will be like a paradise. So, so it helps us to clarify some false concept that is horrible, that is alone, that is dark, that is cold, that is scary, that is like, no, it's a paradise. So put, your, put that in your mind. So why does Jesus use this term to this man? Why didn't he use, you will be in heaven, you will be in the kingdom of heaven, or you will be in my father's house. Why didn't Jesus use this terminology that we, we read in Jesus' sermons? And the New Testament, but why would this man, Jesus, use paradise? He probably never heard any from Jesus. Exactly. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, you win the prize. <laughs> yes. No, that's, that's, that's exactly that. This man, think about where he's coming from. His intellectual, his education, his religious uh, background. Do you think he was a religious man? Do you think he spent his time at the temple every weekend? Look at how he is punished, what, how his life is finished in misery. He was an horrible of the worst, a criminal of the worst kind. So probably his theology, no. Also, another point go in the same direction. How long does he have before he will breathe his last breath? Do you think Jesus has to begin to a, a theological discussions? Oh, my friend, let me explain to you what I mean by the Father's house. Uh, did you know that I am, you know, the Son of God and my Father has a house for you? Do you know where I come from? Do you understand that one day there will be a rapture and the trumpet will sound? You know, Jesus doesn't have time to do that. So Jesus puts himself to the level of this man. This man can understand simple things. Paradise in his time means a good place. So Jesus says, okay, for now, that's enough. That's enough for you. Today you will be in my good place with me. Is that good enough for you? Yes, Lord, it's good enough for me. That's a good place. So Jesus used, and that's a great example for us. That's a, for your sheets, like a, a good, a good um, 
principle to practice in our evangelism. Make yourself to the level of the people you talk. Don't use a lot of, uh, uh, you know, theological jargon when you share the love of Jesus, spreading God's love. If the people come from Catholic background, bring your Catholic knowledge into it. If you talk with a, a, a drug addict, bring your drug talk with, to them. And then when you, you know, whatever it is, like, uh, like the domestic helpers, come on with your domestic helpers uh, conversation and just start where they are. Talk like they are. And just, Jesus, Paul, isn't it what Paul says? He says, I make myself what people are. I want to do everything for them to understand and all this. So, so we're not like really a high theologian when it comes to reaching out to someone. If they are Muslim people, then we need to expand, study a little bit, uh, try to, f to understand our Muslim thing and approach it in a different way, you know. This morning I was talking with uh, Pastor Fayez at the end because you know of the nice experience that he had the other day. And I like to, to talk with him because I always like his, his uh, gentleness and his patience when he approached the Muslim people. I do it for that reason. I don't give it too much because I want to build. I want them to, to build, build a trust. You know, this is a, this is a good story. I, I, I thought he would be here this afternoon. I was going to ask him to share. When he went on this journey last week to Disney with the 20 families of Muslim, it is actually a Chinese church who calls an organization, they have an organization called Neighbors. And they are reaching out to na Muslim neighbors but they have never shared Jesus again or the religious things. Actually, the Muslims didn't even know that they were uh, a church that, at that point. So by inviting uh, Pastor Fayez, he says, Pastor Fayez, we would like you to go a little bit further, but don't really preach a lot. So Pastor Fayez says, okay, I will share the Good Samaritan story. Yeah. And just that. And just like, neighbors, who is your neighbors? And he told the church, the Cantonese church, uh, uh, you know, and the Muslim mind, they don't even know you are a church. They think maybe you receive money from the government and you distribute to them. They should know you are a church. You know, at least they should know that. So, so he just shared the story. People listened intently and he told them that the group, neighbor, that were loving them. They were their neighbor. Who is your neighbor? They were answering very well that they were a church. And then he will go not to preach to the group, but now that he is building bridge one by one, he will go to one family, another family, another family. It takes a long time. But there's a reason why he's doing that. Because if he preach Jesus to the group, someone in the group may discredit him. Just, yeah, you know these people, blah, blah, blah. And then the ones that would, could possibly have opened their heart, be seekers, maybe will be turned away by, by some radical one that will come against. So he says, instead, I will go by them family by family. So this way, there's no interruption, there's no other people. I thought this is very, very clever. So we see it in Jesus here. So let's do the same, present the gospel in simple ways. We see the most complete proof of his power and his will to save. Uh, okay, let me see if it works. Whoops. Yeah, it works so much that I went, I went, I went, I went too far. Okay, it works a lot. Okay, let's read this third text here. So he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus is able to save completely. Or some Bible version, I prefer that old way of speaking, to the uttermost, the highest degree. You cannot be more saved than to the uttermost. You're completely, totally, completely finished. Uh, nothing to add. It, the salvation is once and for all. It's complete. It's perfect. It's nothing to add to that. So that's how Jesus saved this man on the cross. And there's another little thing that we need to observe on that. All those who come to God through him. And this man on the cross has done exactly that. He went to God through Christ. He turned to Jesus. Jesus, Lord, 
remember me when you get into a kingdom. He turned to him with his faith. So that's very, very important. We should admire also how strong our deliverer is. There's a picture of that that we need to appreciate and admire Jesus. Okay, what was the state in which Jesus was in that story? What was he? Was he like uh, relaxed and uh, drinking a uh, Coca-Cola? Well, what, what was he like? Suffering. He, suffering and pain. Do you think it's little pain, big pain, excruciating pain? Yeah, the worst time. How many hours will he still be alive in that story? Maybe an hour or I don't know, something like that. Because it's already dark. If you read that story from the little bit before, you know, it's, I think it's at 3 o'clock, the old sky became dark. That's at this moment, I, didn't, I never realized that, but it's at this moment that this man turned to Jesus. Something happened in the environment that was revealing this is a special moment. And this is at this moment that this man turned to Jesus, remember me when you are in your kingdom. Because something is happening, this is not normal what is happening. So now f focus on Jesus. He is crucified. He is in pain. He is thirsty. His bones are disloc dislocating and, you know, like uh, whatever state you can imagine of the worst kind. Normally, would you show compassion to other people? Would you be kind to other people? Would you be turned toward other people's feeling? If you cannot even bear your own pain and your own state, would you be able to do that? That's how strong Jesus is. And that's, we need to admire Jesus just for, for that reason at least. Because in the worst possible state, the, 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 the worst excruciating thing, thing, he can think of this man's needs. He can show compassion and kindness to this man. And total pain, dying on the cross, he is able to show kindness is able to comfort this lost sinner and to reassure him that he will be safe with him in heaven. I think I would say that deserves a, a hand to the Lord, really, because nobody can do that but Jesus. If ever someone was too far to be saved, it was this dying criminal, and Jesus is saving him. So we learn that Christ will receive any sinner. Look at this next verse here. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. What an encouragement it is to you and to me when we share the gospel to someone else. Just ask them a question. Just start a conversation. Brigitte and I went to an art uh, gallery uh, the other night and we met a few people there. Says, oh, do, you, do you believe in Jesus? At least just ask the question. It, it opens the, something to say. Just ask a simple question that, that the person will say yes or no. If you say no, okay, now you know what to do next. There is no expiration of date of this promise. It doesn't say, I will not cast out a sinner the first time he comes. Only any time a sinner will come, even if he comes, has to come again. I will actually, uh, Spurgeon says, this text here is, I will not, not cast out. There's a repeating of the not, not, of the negative. I will never, never. That's, that's how strong this text is. And I think it's really important for us. Think of this man. Uh, he was never been in the church, he didn't go to synagogue, he was not baptized, he wasn't uh, reading the scriptures, uh, he didn't give money to the poor, he didn't serve Christ, didn't take communion, didn't do anything. That's what we call grace. You are saved by grace, a gift of God. It's by faith that people are saved and that's what we see here. Jesus can heal and save anyone. What if you have many sins? Many habits. Maybe in this room here we have people who are not yet right. I mean you're on the way, you're thinking about it, but you have not yet solved that. That's for you this afternoon. His faith was not even a day old. Was this man saved, you think? Hello? Yes. You think this man was saved on the spot? Yes? yes? yes. How, how deep, how big, how long was his faith? 
not even one day old. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, half an hour, half an hour faith. Do you have more than half an hour faith? This man has an half an hour faith, but his faith was complete. His faith was enough to have touched the Lord Jesus, that the Lord speak a word of salvation, a word, such a word of assurance. Amen. Hallelujah. Heaven is not shut. Christ will always accept you if you humbly come to him with faith, even if you mess up. Okay, lesson number two. There's a warning in that text here that we should not overlook. Look at the sad ending of the second criminal. There's one who go to with the Lord forever. The other one, what happened to him? Where is he going to go? Okay, why has the other one not turned to Jesus? Why? Did, didn't they were at the same place? Didn't have the same background? Didn't have the same Jesus with them? Didn't he hear Jesus speak to his friend? And why not says, okay, me too, Lord, please. I, I, I agree. I'm also bad. Lord also receive me. Why not? Why didn't he go to the Lord in this way? We should not overlook that. What became of him? Why didn't he turn to the Lord? Why did he remain hardened? And nothing proved that he was worse than the other in a way. It, they seem that they have been partners in crime. For we are receiving the due reward of our deed. That's the text that we're looking at. Bridget and I, when we were saved, we had a friend who grew up as a neighbor from Bridget on the farm, a young man, who had been through some mental problems like depression, that which turned later on to schizophrenia, things like this. But we have been a friend. We used to take drugs together. We used to do things together. Uh, we was close to the family of Bridget. The night we were safe, he was sitting. We were on the front row just like that, the three of us side by side. Both Bridget and I had a dramatic conver conversion. Yeah, you heard, probably many of you heard our, our testimony. I, he I heard the voice of Jesus speaking to me. Bridget had a vision of Jesus on the cross. Like, and there was a big anointing on the speaker. He was talking about being born again. We were really touched. We were, we were totally saved that night. We, I was delivered miraculously of drugs and one prayer. I was transform into a new person Bridget also she saw Jesus beaten on the cross Bridget, she had never read Isaiah 52 in her life she didn't know that but she saw that Jesus described of Isaiah chapter 52 and Jesus telling her this is for you that I have done that with loving eyes she saw the vision I heard the voice we were both saved that night our friend Mark didn't same thing as in this story here after that, we talked to him many, many times. I have time. And he used that story on my deathbed. I'm too young. I want to enjoy my life. Maybe later, I'll think about it. Then he did another depression. He went to hospital. He received electric shock, blah, 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 took drugs. And then he became more and more of a zombie. Then we still contacted with him. He came to our home. At one point, he says, stop telling us about Jesus. Stop, stop telling me about Jesus. And then we says, we cannot stop telling you about Jesus because this is who we are. You see us, you see Jesus. We speak, we speak of Jesus. That, that's how we were. We were very radical in Jesus. We had only one life. So if you come to our home, you will hear about Jesus. There's no way around that, you know. So, but then we continued on. Then he went worse and worse, went back to hospital, and then uh, more shock and all of this. And one day, they found him on the brink of a, of a lake. There was a place where people were not supposed to go swimming because it was, you know, dangerous. He was there, and he had a Volkswagen van, and he died there. He committed suicide. And he wrote a letter to God on that night when, I mean, I don't know if it's night or day, and when they found him, he was already rotting away because it was summer days and it was hot. What happened? We were in the same message 
We received exactly the same thing. We came from the same background, cultural background, education background, uh, social background, like everything the same, just like this. One gets saved, the other one is hardened. Yes, yes, it is, it is. You know, people will say that on my deathbed, Mark, my friend Mark says that later on my deathbed, I have time. I, when I be near my death, when I grow old, I will say, the deathbed is not always a saving time. Because when you're too weak, when you're drugged by the medicine for pain, or when you have a sudden car accident, or you have anything, you don't know when you go. So near death experience is playing with your life to go to hell. Two people, same position. One repent, the other one go to hell. Don't fool yourself with my deathbed. I can repent on my own time. Later I will repent. Whoa, wow. Many will slip away quite unprepared to die. Most people except Christian are always unprepared to die. Nobody is prepared to die. Nobody is thinking, okay, I'm going to die next week, I'm going to organize my life, all this. Like, no, <laughs> unless they have a verdict from the doctor or something like that. But we're not prepared to die. Even Christian, unfortunately, we are not even prepared to die. We are not ready to die because we have not yet understood or put something glorious. Like Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise, a b nice beautiful park with animals and you know, cats and dogs and eagles and whatever it is, even more for extraordinary birds and whatever. I like parakeets, I like to hear these kind of things, you know. Flowers and smelling and all of this. It will be beautiful to be in heaven. The delusions of thinking, the popular thought that at the time when I will be near death. You know people think, when I will be near death, the love of the world in me and my carnal passions will disappear from my heart. Just by itself, just like that, because I'm near death. All of this will go away. What a lie. And the heart will open itself to the word of life. Do, do you believe that? No, no. You know, in the Bible, there is only one death, death bad experience, which is bringing hope that it is possible. But there's only one. There are not hundreds of them. There's only one. So don't play with that. Don't take your chance. Don't take your chance. When Jesus called you to repent, when he comes knocking at the door, open it. Open it right now. Don't push it until later. Don't take for granted. Number three lessons on that, there are some evidence that the Holy Spirit is doing something, you know, and that story. It's always the Holy Spirit that leads to salvation in one way or another. With the, the thief on the night, on the, the thief on the cross, it was very quick. Very quick work of the Holy Spirit. He realized something about Jesus. He turned to Jesus. Jesus immediately says, today, you will be with me. Very quick. With other people, it will be long process, progressive, step by step by step by step. One year this, another year that, and then progressively the heart will come to a conviction, but always by the Holy Spirit. See how strong was the faith of this man. Many of you have said it already. He called Jesus Lord. Lord, Jesus, Lord. He believed that Jesus had the kingdom. And your sheet, you have the, what are some of the requirements that have? Okay, let me say this. I have two more questions for you to write on your sheet <laughs> that I forgot. It came to me just before I arrived from lunch. What gospel truths are included in that story that are necessary for salvation? What gospel truths, aspect of the gospel message, are necessary for salvation that are included in that story? What gospel truths are included in this message that are necessary for salvation? 
we are we are answering that right now he called Jesus Lord he believed that Jesus was the king or the Messiah he declared that Jesus was innocent but this man has done nothing wrong that is necessary you know if you want to think about this this is very special another point that is at this time that Jesus was hanging on the cross it seems that Jesus had only one disciple this man where were the other men the other disciple what was their fate all of them had abandoned them the whole nation rejected him think about it what was the mindset of the other disciples of Jesus at that moment did they believe that Jesus was the victorious God Savior and Messiah they were defeated they were hiding the, the, the disciples of Emmaus we had hope that this man was but you have heard what happened in Jerusalem it's too bad they went back fishing they, they lost the balloon got busted there was only one disciple of Jesus when Jesus was on the cross it seems this man was isn't that a wonderful story think about it he was the only disciple says Lord bring me with you in your kingdom I'm going with you Lord you know Peter had says Lord I'm going with you to death then he ran away this man says okay Lord bring me into eternity with you and just says today you will be with me this is a wonderful story this is deep his prayer was very very simple remember me that's his prayer remember me that's 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 all from his cross Jesus spoke with the authority of a king Jesus says well let's see maybe uh, if it's possible no just as truly truly I say to you truly I say to you I say to you today with me in paradise that is what I truly say to you be sure of that that's my authority that's my word he spoke with the authority of a king and Jesus spoke of something also very wonderful he spoke of death not like the end but that after death there was a continuous existence of life today you will be with me and paradise we will transfer into paradise actually I just watched a little uh, video uh, on last week on YouTube it's a man that was very popular in Canada but now he's an old man I, mean, I think maybe he's passed away or if not he, he's very old and it was uh, called the, the last recording of David Maines he had like a, a Christian TV uh, in Canada for many years like 100 uh, what was it 700 club or something like that Huntley Street yeah in Canada and now he was an old man so I was surprised to see him because I have known him as a young man he was talking with his grandfather with his granddaughter about heaven and he said that he had a very near-death experience that he thought he was going to die a few years back that world but he survived that but at that time he was in hospital surrounded by his family because he was going to die and then he says when I close my eyes I saw a curtain that's not only a curtain and on the other side is eternity when I would open my eyes then I would see people they were there with me the nurse the family they were there then I would close my eyes I see this curtain and on the other side is eternal life just a curtain and to him he described it is it's so near it's only a curtain you just go on the other side of the curtain you enter into eternal life says wow this is a nice picture about you know cr passing from death to life because so many of us we are afraid so Jesus talks in this way a continuous state of existence life after death amen the man was totally saved by grace his salvation was personal his salvation was secure and his salvation was guaranteed by the Lord Jesus like nobody else had this man had hoped 
that may be in the future, because if you look carefully at this request, Lord, remember me in the future. When do you say remember me? There's, there's a, a period of time. Remember me next year, or remember me later on. When you get there, remember me later. But Jesus says today. Not later, today. It's already done deal. So it's not about the future, but it's that very day. Amen. Think about that. The disciple had been with Jesus. They had seen miracles. The dead raised, the lepers healed, the blind receiving their sight, the dumb could speak, the lame could walk. They had seen thousands fed with few loaves and fish. They had seen Jesus walk on the water. It's wonderful what they have seen. This thief on the cross saw nothing of that kind. No miracles, nothing, but he believed. Right there, he believed. That's wonderful. He only saw Jesus and the suffering state. He doesn't see a crown, a king, a white horse. He didn't see glory, strength, power, uh, you know. He didn't see. He saw a broken body. He saw someone in pain and in suffering, and he believed. Think about that. Everything that we do, Christian, to try to convince the world that Christianity is a good thing, you know, all the things that we try to put before, to put them like, like it's good if you believe in Jesus, all the good things, the, the prosperity gospel, everything like that. This dying thief saw nothing of anything like that. When I was saved, I remember, there was nothing in that evening that pleased me. I didn't like the song. I didn't like the room. I didn't like the way people dress. I didn't like anything of that night of external I only was touched by the power of the Holy Spirit and convinced that I was better to give my life to Jesus nothing that attracted me oh I love the music they're so cool no I didn't like it. I despised them because I was you know a hippie or something with my long hair everybody they had a tie short hair they look so straight and they call them brother and sisters so what is that you know it was in the primary school environment I used to be you know in dark places you know and I didn't like anything but the power of God boom grabbed me so 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 this man saw no royal crown, no majesty, no power, yet the dying thief believed. That is the proof of the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So that is another lesson for us. If we want to be successful in evangelism, we cannot beat, we cannot compete, we cannot improve on the power of the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, you can speak as long as you want. Maybe you have this experience, I had it in the experience before. I used to preach to people from Genesis to Revelation in one evening. Four or five hours, try to convince them, the Old Testament, New Testament, prophecy, Jesus returned, la, 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 la. And they were just waiting for me to leave the house <laughs> so that they can go to sleep. <laughs> That's, that's sometimes like this. We Yeah. Wow. Hey, we need just the power of the Holy Spirit. So one, okay, last point. One of the signs of the conversion of this man on the cross, he tried to lead his friend. He tried to bring sense to his friend because he felt that faith. He turned to Jesus and he rebuked his friend. Don't you fear the Lord? Look, this man. He has done nothing wrong. Stop talking about that. So already this man on the cross is thinking of his friend. And that tells me that if you and I, we are saved, we need to have some stirring up in our heart of, by the Holy Spirit that we think of other people who are unsaved in the same way. Some sort of a zeal to tell others, to bring them to conversion. You know the Samaritan woman? What happened? She ran, she left her water, she came to the well for water. When she talked to Jesus, she forget her water. And she ran to town, hey, come and see, come and hear a man. He told me this, he told me that, couldn't he be the Messiah? And then they came and they heard and they got saved. First thing she's done when she met Jesus, as soon as she thought that he was the one, she just forgot her water. The Apostle Paul, the persecutor that we heard about in the sermon this morning, 
What did he do first thing? He returned to the synagogue that uh, uh, crucified put to death Stephen and he went to them because he was part of that synagogue and he went to tell them that Christ was the Son of God. First thing he did, he returned there and he told them. So can you see any of these evidences of the Holy Spirit and your conversion or after your conversion? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So that was my message this afternoon just to stir up inspiring this wonderful, wonderful